the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, Imperial citizens, to The Emperor Protects. My name is Doug with 2 Plus Tough and my co-host, Dan, with Cubic Shenanigans. How you doing, buddy? Doing wonderful, my friend. It's awesome to be back and talking about heresy again. Absolutely. Now, when we started this show, the idea that we wanted to put out there for people was that we read the book so that you don't have to, is essentially yep. the, the core idea. Yeah. Uh, and I think this book takes the cake for that because it is widely regarded as one of the weaker Horus Heresy books, but I yes. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Yeah. Um, and it I is, think at ahead. the beginning, you know, we're going to, and when I look through the notes, it's one of the things I wanted to stress uh, of what makes this book unique, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at this point. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, if you don't know, we're talking all about Legion today, which is a uh, Horus Heresy book focused around the... Um, Alpha Legion. I don't know why that just skipped on my brain. <laughs> it's not like we're talking about it all day, but um, and so we're going to be jumping into that. I didn't see any listener mail questions, so if you have those, please consider. You know, you can either contact them at Cubic Shenanigans, me on YouTube, or um, my Discord, which I have all that stuff in the description down below. Um, okay. So with no questions in the way, let's get straight into it. Uh, Dan, you have a few. You have a preamble, as I think what we've yeah. kind of decided on this one. It's a one it's a big book. <laughs> I, I think is unique, among other things, is that this book is set about two years before the beginning of the heresy. Yes, and a lot of books we've talked about already are before the heresy, but then they roll into it. So mm -hmm. we see what happens with that particular legion of the story. This isn't like that. Even at the end of this book, it's still a couple years out. Yeah, um, and what we have is. It's really it introduces the the readers to the enigmatic. I think that's a great word for the Alpha Legion, and they're, the Legion's called to aid in the compliance of a world called Nerth. Mm -hmm. And the actors here, again, this is what makes it very unique. This book are not just the Alpha Legion. This is not just an Alpha Legion story, uh, uh, but they're men of the men and women of the Imperial Guard. Yep. Uh, the human forces are commanded by this total tool, Tang Namajir. I can't stand <laughs> this guy. He's just a pompous jerk. Um, and we'll see that as we talk about the story. Uh, but all is not what it seems here because – and that's, of course, appropriate for the Alpha Legion. Yeah, because yeah. the primary focus of the story is – the Alpha Legion kind of moving in and out of the other players in the story and interacting with them. They'll appear, they'll disappear. They'll engage with someone and then they'll go away again. Yep. And you get a lot of narrative of the regiments and the characters we're going to talk about. But the main focus of the several guard regiments is there is a regiment called the Geno 5-2 Chiliad. And, mm -hmm. um, just real quickly, one of the things that makes them very unique is that they have a group of, I would consider them senior officers. They'd be like colonels in charge of a regiment or something. They're called Uxors, yep. all female, and they function, they're low-level psychers. And they have a little retinue of little Uxors in waiting. They're kind of running around it, but they use mm -hmm. something called the Sept, which is how they send orders. Yes. So they don't use a vox or anything basically they just sept their orders out to their uh more junior officers who are called hetman mm -hmm. uh, they're all male interesting again in the organization they kind of function when you read the story and you hear the talk they're more like senior non-coms in the military yes i think but um it's really really interesting so the sept is basically a form of telepathy um, it doesn't, though, appear that it allows the Uxors to read thoughts, but so it's kind of like a transmitter, not a receiver. The other right. thing, though, that's important is they are very size sensitive. So if there's any kind of psychic activity going around, they can kind of tell what's happening with that. So yep. I think that's an important part before we start the story, because uh, mo some of the main characters are either Uxors or Hetman. Yes, and it, uh, and it does explain the characters kind of move around the planet with a lot of freedom, and it didn't sink yeah. in until like I started thinking about their rank of like, okay, these aren't just run-of-the-mill dudes who just abandoned yeah. their units. These are the bosses who are allowed to do whatever they want. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. Um, and I think, again, this book is a significant departure from not only previous but subsequent Horace Heresy novels. Oh, absolutely. Because there's, there's no real Legion versus Legion set piece battles here. Yep. Which makes sense because it's before the heresy. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only one significant battle, which is very cool. Um, and it's between the native Nerthine who are fighting the Imperial forces. Uh, but most of the combat that you read in here is very tactical in scale. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it only involves like a couple few Alpha Legionnaires yep. like, until the end of the book, right? Yeah. Um, and so compare that to like Horus Rising or First Heretic or Thousand Sums or even Fulgrim, which we just mm -hmm. talked about. Um, and I think personally, this is one of the reasons that maybe this book didn't gain traction, uh, uh, you know, among a large portion of the fandom yeah. because people kind of want that. But I think it makes this book such a good read because it is so different. I I think it definitely subverted expectations. You see the giant space marine on the cover of Legion, and you're like, oh, Alpha Legion, heck yeah, their name's in the thing. And you get really excited about it for, for Legionnaires. What I think this book did, if if you're from my channel and you have read um, Dominion by Darius Hanks, it's an Age of Sigmar book, that's yep. one where they took forces that we, we largely knew, Orcs and Stormcast, and they described them from the perspective of the people who first encountered these weird orcs who set traps instead of just running mm. headlong. Mm -hmm. And then most of the people didn't really care for that book either, but I loved it because I, and I'm now going back to Legion is your perspective is fixed at trying to understand demigods at a human level. You're with all these axors and all these bosses and things are happening above you somehow, like below you in terms of rank around you physically. Like what does it look like? when a space marine chapter or legion rather that's all about secrecy does war it's just i think a lot of people wanted to see that from their perspective and i think you bring up an excellent point is that all we hear about in the heresy is how much people like there's such a mystery you know space marines yeah. are like this mystery we've never seen a space marine and all that and i think this book helps you understand how that would feel because mm -hmm. these characters experience that for the first time when they see a Marine um, and how they're interacting with them. I think there are two other things that are pretty critical before we start. One Please. is a very, very important character who's a human, which again, this is very different than a lot of books. His name is John Grammaticus. He's a very, very special individual and his subplot kind of weaves in and out of the story mm -hmm. a lot like the Alpha Legion. Uh, and, to me, this is kind of his story as much as it is the Alpha Legion story. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that makes him interesting is he is a perpetual. So he has been alive from what we can read, Doug, like over a thousand years. Yep. Yeah. He met the emperor, was about to high five him. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I think the character of John Grammaticus is very important to point out. Another thing. That oh, wait, I can think I? Uh, oh, I just want to ask uh, on the note of John Grammaticus before we go on. Did you read the Dead Tree book or did you listen to the audio book? I this I have read the Dead Tree book. I listened to the audio book this time. Okay, so I did as well, and it was very jarring that like the John Grammaticus voice that the guy does is is the most painfully American thing ever. It's like a <laughs> British guy pretending to be an American. It's like the Oxel raised great. his gun. What are you going to do with that, said John Grammaticus. And you're like, what is he talking like that? That's great. <laughs> Keep it British. Yeah. They're all from the same place. <laughs> so so, re so, listeners, maybe you want to read the story. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's it just great... sounds like they dropped an American into any movie plot. <laughs> yeah. I know what needs to be done here. <laughs> it's so funny because, like, the voicing that he does for the Hetman I know. is, like, so perfect for, like, a non-com or a sergeant or something. That's that's excellent. And then you, yeah, that's, that's so great. Okay, uh, please continue with the learning. No, that's fine. No, another thing we have that's very unique here is something called the Cabal. And this is basically a Xenos confab that wants to manipulate mankind's destiny. Yes. Um, and they say that they are dedicated to the defeat of the primordial annihilator, which is chaos. Mm -hmm. um, they are very powerful. Yep. And uh, they're aware that the heresy is coming, and they believe that the Alpha Legion is the last chance for 
mankind to be saved from the predation of the chaos powers. This is this is the one part of the book that I think is just epically flawed in terms of logic and reasoning. Thank you. Because <laughs> it, it just like there, and we'll talk about it more as we get to the you know to the end where they actually talk to the Alpha Legion. But mm -hmm. it's just like they believe that Horus has to win in order to defeat chaos. And I'm like, wait a minute. And even their logic at the end doesn't make any sense because they're making these huge assumptions about Horus. Yeah. And based on the, you know, vagaries of chaos, it just makes no sense. So, but it's interesting and it's an element in the story. Uh, and John Grammaticus, who we talked about is actually an agent for the cabal. Yes. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, to that point, we have to act with some sense of dramatic irony. John Grammaticus does not know what the Cabal actually wants this entire book. He's just trying to set up a meeting. He's basically like yes. a receptionist for the Cabal. <laughs> so he doesn't know what he's getting everybody into when he sets up this meeting, but we're going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of your favorite parts is the end, and I actually took the quote from John Grammaticus out of the book if you didn't. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> I so texted you right after I finished what, it. <laughs> what, he's, what he's doing at the end. One last quick thing. There are, and you and I have talked about this before, there are so many names in this book. Yep. So we have, listeners, filtered all but the most important of them so you can focus on the story. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to be responsible for your death when you fall asleep driving. <laughs> no, because there's way too many names. So do you have any other pre-story, you know, kind of pre-discussion thoughts or anything else you think we need to... Um, no, hit? other than my, my observation about kind of the, the point of view is that we're, we're watching secrecy in action, which means you don't get all the answers, you don't trust the answers that you get, and you just kind of take it at face value. <laughs> yes. And that's kind of what we got. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the story a little bit. So okay. we are on the planet of Nerth. Yes, yes. And things are not going well for Lord Commander Teng Namajira. Uh, he's very prestigious and accomplished, supposedly. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a lot of very ancient and elite Imperial Guard regiments involved. Uh, but the native inhabitants, the Nerthine surprisingly they're holding off yeah. the imperial forces and they're doing it with swords and like darts yeah it's basically the movie avatar yeah, exactly <laughs> right it is and so they strike from the dark the shadows the fog dust storms mm -hmm. all the while you know this is going on you also see that the skies are beginning to look a little weird they're discoloring and they're starting to churn and you're going, hmm, all mm -hmm. right, something's going on. And the Nerthine have been driven into their last stronghold, which is the port city of Monlo Harbor. Yes. Uh, that's kind of where we are in terms of the overall um, situation. Yes. So uh, the Astartes reinforcements are called for because they just can't get through <laughs> yes. what's, what's there. And so, of course, the Alpha Legion is called, and Alpharius is their primarch, and they respond kind of, because what happens is they're there, but mm -hmm. Namajira doesn't even know they're there. And yes. the only reason we know they're there is because there are certain characters in the book that we're going to talk about that have these individual encounters, and mm -hmm. they're very brief encounters with one or two of the Alpha Legion, and then they disappear again. So you know they're on the planet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it's the equivalent of, you know, you're having trouble like opening a box, and the, before you can even say, "Hey, does anyone have a pair of scissors?" Someone just like walks up behind you and is like, "Here you go with a box cutter." And you're like, "I don't yeah. know you. How'd you get in my house?" <laughs> but thank you for thank your you. Help. Yeah, kind of. It's like a dubious thank you. <laughs> you turn around to give it back, and they're gone. Yeah, it's like what? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh so uh, we have, of course, at this time as well, John Grammaticus. And I think it's really great the way Dan Abnett wrote this guy as a mm -hmm. character because he's serving as a spy for the Imperials. But he's also acting as a spy for the Cabal at the yes. same time. So as he put it, or someone put it, what a better cover for a spy than to be a spy. Yes, of course. <laughs> It's perfect. And they have no idea, Nabajir and his people, that he's there, what he's doing. Uh, 
important point, he is a very powerful psyker, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he is a logistat or logistician. I can't remember the term they use, but he's exceptional at... uh, like learning languages, he can yes. listen to one sentence of a language and he can speak it fluently. Uh, he can read lips. He can determine intentions based on body language. Mm-hmm. He's just very, very perceptive. And uh, a few other things. He can also tell the difference between space marines, which is hard to do because as they augment themselves, they tend to all look the same. So to other people, yes. all the Alpha Legionnaires look the same. But John is someone who's able to discern who is who and know who he's talking to. Which ends up being a really cool trick when you're, you know, when everyone's Alfarious. <laughs> right. It, it really it really gets them kind of spun up when they mm-hmm. realize. They, they don't, don't like that. that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, now, John's purpose in the story is to convince the Alpha Legion to meet with the Cabal. That is his primary goal. So he has to contact them convince them that they should meet with a bunch of aliens because the universe will end if they don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. that just, doesn't that just sound nuts? <laughs> but that's really what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just come together. And, I mean, initially they talk about, like, we just want to stop the Horus heresy. Yes. Okay, fine. And at the end it's, there's a bait and switch, and you're like, this doesn't make sense. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And, and this is a point. You make a good point, and we'll, again, talk about it. But... Like, if the cabal is so powerful, and they're trying to manipulate, you know, things so that Horus wins and, and defeats Chaos somehow, why didn't they just stop the heresy? Like, why didn't I, they just stop Erebus from taking the thing? Well, you I know? mean, they definitely could have gone further back. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, but <laughs> exactly. So it just it, this is one of those things where the cabal is the only you know, weird, weak link in the story. But otherwise, all good. I I have a theory on that at the end. (laughs) Okay, please. All right, good. Um, So, as you know, he's working for, as an agent for the Imperium. And so his assignment was to infiltrate the city of Monlo Harbor. And I think one of the interesting parts of the story is when he goes in for the second time. And he starts walking into the city. Now, remember, he's... He can be whoever he wants to be. He has this weird ability to kind of mimic people. Mm-hmm. And so the Nerthine don't know that he's not Nerthine, you yes. know, when he walks into the city. And he starts getting this weird feeling like that the, there's a presence that's kind of there looking for him, is trying to find him. Be, and he can tell because of his uh, because of his psychic, you know, abilities. And he feels, like I said, like the city's looking for him. So he finds refuge in a residential area. And this is where he meets up with the Alpha Legion for the first time. And this guy's name is Captain Peck. And Captain Peck is actually a character that, no no major spoiler here, we're going to see again during the siege. So he's, he's a long-lasting person within the story. Cool. Uh, and he's accompanied by a very powerful psyker named Sheer who's actually more powerful than Dramaticus. And it's so funny because <laughs> one of the things, so you can tell that Dramaticus or Grammaticus just wants to like touch Peck's mind just to see something. And he's like, stop it, John, <laughs> John, don't do that. And then like the third time Sheer just slams him with this psychic punch and throws him like across the room. And yep. he's like, okay. Yep. You poked it. <laughs> Shouldn't have poked it. John, I warned you. <laughs> now, the other thing that's cool about this scene is that uh, the city has found them, though. And they're, you know, this is kind of a safe house they're in. And all of a sudden, like thousands of little tiny lizards start pouring into the house. It was just a great image, right? And then after the lizards, there's giant crocodiles. And you go, what? And then all of a sudden, there's like a demonic dragon that appears. <laughs> and it was just amazing. Such a great action scene. It yes. makes it very clear, however, that chaos is at work here. Mm-hmm. And from my perspective, given the description of the Nerthine fighters, like the colors of their clothing are like pink and purple, you know, that kind of thing. The fact mm-hmm. that it's a reptilian form, I think it's pretty clear that this is Slanesh here. 
Yeah, I, yeah, yes. There's no like um, specific mentions or like that, but no. I, definitely for sure, I could definitely see that. Yeah, and and you're not told that as you said in the book, but yeah. So so that's what we're working with. Um, so there's a lot going on in the book, Doug. Besides Grammaticus, as okay. we said, there's a lot of interaction between members of the Lord Commander's staff and his bodyguards, who are called the Lucifer Blacks, who are just yes. total jerks, like he is. Yeah, and those are um, bodyguards that are like super augmented to be oh. out the nines assassin level stuff. Yeah, they're they're about as close to space marines as they could be, I think. Right? Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the idea. There's a yeah. few things like that in Forty K. Yeah. So um, the the interaction in this is that the Lucifer Blacks have actually figured out that there might be a spy. Yes. And they're pretty sure that it has something to do with the guys from the Geno Five Two Chiliad. And uh, this part of the story is kind of funny to me as well, because you have Lucifer Blacks who are looking for a spy. And it turns out they're looking for a spy who's serving their in their army as a spy, but they don't know he's a spy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I got that out. That's good. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, the, the four main characters that we're going to talk about here are two of the Uxors. We talked about them, Honan Mu yep. and Ruxana Saeed. Interestingly enough, John Grammaticus is having an affair with Ruxana, mm-hmm. and that affects you know how the Lucifer Blacks like f- end up focusing on her to try to find some of this spy yeah. stuff. This is and a lot of subplot have, stuff going on here. <laughs> two of the Hetman, uh, Pedo Sonica and Bronzy, are the two characters um, who, in the end end up being recruited as operatives for the Alpha Legion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So very cool. Uh, The Alpha Legion obviously are looking for people who are very tough, very resourceful. And yeah, that's what ends up happening. uh, I think for those two specifically, the resourcefulness, they have these stories that bring them all over the place. Peto Sonica has an awesome backstory. Like the Alpha Legion sacrificed his entire regiment as a, basically a meat shield during the book. And so he's like, this all sucks. <laughs> and so you get these people who are like jaded, but still devout. And they're just, yeah, cra- hand- handy, crafty, and smart. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting, the writing to, you know, handy and crafty. Dan Abnett doesn't make it clear if these guys are loyal to the Alpha Legion or if they've still retained some of their loyalty to you know, the Geno 5-2 Chiliad. You, you can't really tell for a long time in the book. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, at one point, Honan Mu, who is this other Uxor, she suspects Sonic and Bronzy of something. They don't know what. But she knows something's going on. Uh, so they have to be really careful around her uh, because, obviously, they have to respond to anything that the Alpha Legion asks them to do. Yeah. But still be hetman yep. under under these uxors and uh all those interactions between those four characters i think are very fascinating and they're very much a key part of the story mm-hmm. yes and when they come together and pull information it's it's kind of when i think the story like in the second act really starts to move forward is mm-hmm. all these disparate like what's going on comes together <laughs> okay. okay i don't know i'm just saying like th- no, their I, stories I, individually come together to be great I agree with that because, yeah, because otherwise it would just be these little subplots yes. that never tie together. And you're absolutely right. Uh, and he does, as usual, he does a great job of, you know, writing six different stories but having everything move forward together. I don't, I don't know how he does that, but he continues to do it um, as a writer. Mm-hmm. So at one point, uh, Grammaticus receives a revelation from the Cabal because he's got kind of this weird, like. Yeah, what you want to call it, communications thing, where all of a sudden they can kind of appear to him. He sees them in water, like you'll have bowls yes. of water laying around, and then yeah. they just show themselves. Kind of Galadriel's mirror, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. And one of them is a uh, Eldar Autark, Slauda, and he's just—it's wonderful because in the audio, especially, but the book to a point, you can just hear the uh, the. Um, arrogance just dripping off of his mm-hmm. voice. Yes. <laughs> he he sounds like a total to tool. <laughs> a monkey. You know? And 
the cabal though gives grammaticus a revelation and that's that the nerthine are possession of a black cube this is really important in the story in that uh this is a device it kind of acts like i don't know how to best describe it a ritualistic focus i think yes and if you make enough sacrifice obviously in lives it can destroy an entire planet Mm -hmm. basically is what happens it's kind of like when the inquisition does exterminatus it's it's kind of the equivalent of that yeah absolutely Uh, and so this kind of puts things on a fast track now because grammaticus has not really had a chance to find Alfarius, who he needs to find. You know, right. of course, the Marines he's met are saying, I'm Alfarius. And the next uh, yeah. one's like, I'm Alfarius. And John's like, uh, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not buying it. <laughs> so he has to find Alfarius and warn him because if he doesn't, well, we're going to find out. The fun thing, though, in the story as this is happening is all of a sudden along the Imperial lines, because it's kind of like a siege around this Monmo Harbor city. Yeah. All of a sudden they're starting to talk that the city has begun to scream. Yes. You're going, whoa, that can't be good. There's no way that that ends well for anybody. (laughs) Not at all, man. Uh, So that that takes us to that point. Is there anything else up to this point that you want to... Um, add or anything I, you can I think, think it's of. just important to emphasize at this point the the leader of the army uh there the oh, Senate Namajira. Jira, as I, I get Namajira, yeah. Namajira, okay so at this point he is very confused because they, he knows he has a spy below him uh, in the form of john grammaticus doesn't know who that is necessarily at this point but he knows he has a spy problem um but then there's also a second spy problem above him with the space marines and he he can't order them around like and so he at this point no one actually knows okay well are these two separate things are they connected is it the nerve and um, now we're being told we have to leave the planet you know by the space marines or whatever i don't know if i got too far ahead for you but like no, that's fine we'll, it, we'll get it's, there. it's just a matter of who do you trust you know and everybody is being distrustful your sub- subordinates below you and the people above you and it's just like dang <laughs> well you you made a good point again that you know nabajira literally doesn't even know the alpha legions in the system yes until later in the story and all of a sudden he's going what they're here already and he's rude to them <laughs> <laughs> he is not a happy camper man no. and here's one of the first scenes i think that i really just this guy just lit me up i just couldn't stand him is they find out the the alpha legions there and they invite alfarius quote <laughs> to a, <laughs> uh, a like a state dinner you yes know? and there's this really wonderful description of all the imperial officers and stuff including namajira and you're just going Oh my God! Do these guys even fight battles? Like it's mm-hmm. just—he's wearing this it, it, ornate is an understatement to so the stuff he's wearing. I'm going, what? What is this? Because you think of people like Macarius, you know, in 40K, and you think about he always fought from the front, and you think of other great leaders that always fight from the front, and you just see this Namajira guy just sitting back in his fancy clothes yeah. and his fancy food and his fancy entourage. Uh, ready for Coachella. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's perfect. And you just got to hate him because he's – but getting back, I segued a little bit there. but no, you're he, good. Um, He's kind of now all of a sudden, to your point, going – What's going on? And then he six the this is when he six the Lucifer Blacks on the some of the main characters to find out what's going on because we know there's a spy now because while they were having the state dinner, John Grammaticus was trying to break into it to get hold of Alf, <laughs> you know Alfarius and he kills a Lucifer Black which is almost impossible to do. And I mean, he got jacked up. Oh yeah, he, he, <laughs> he didn't walk pretty, away good. <laughs> no, uh, but um, so yeah, there, there's that whole thing, and um, yeah, so that's that's where we are in the story. Yeah. Uh, so at this point now, the we have the black cube. Yes. Um, and I, I think I kind of spoiled it there, but people start pulling out because this cube is supposed to explode. Yeah, and. 
this is where you kind of understand what the Nerthine are up against or are up to, because this is where you have a major set piece battle in the book. And it has nothing to do with the Alpha Legion. Again, like we talked about, they combat wise are not really involved too much until the end. And there are, you know, these siege lines and they have these berms built and all this stuff. And it's the middle of the night. And all of a sudden this like just misty cloud just starts approaching the Imperial lines and it's it's a wonderful battle description by by Dan Abnett, and all of a sudden this mist like comes up to the Imperials, and the Nerthy just just come out of the mist. Yes, like they're there the whole time, and not only Nerthy, you get these huge crocodilian things and all kinds of weird creatures coming out, mm-hmm. and they just boom, they hit the Imperial lines, and you kind of think that the Imperial lines are stretched and ready to break. There are thousands of Nerthines that are coming forward. Thousands of them are dying. Thousands of Imperials are dying. And you're going, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Like, (laughs) you get that moment where I see what they're doing here. (laughs) The more people that die, the faster the cube goes into action. Absolutely. Right? And... It, again, is a wonderful description. They end up uh, kind of stopping the advance, and a couple of our friends, uh, Bronzy and Sonic, are involved in the holding off the Nerthine, and that's a cool description. They're titans that come in and start pushing back the Nerthine. Mm-hmm. But by then, too many people have died, and it's too late. Yeah, actually, it kind of reminded me a lot of uh, The Battle for Kelth. Um, mm-hmm. What was the name of that book? Uh, wasn't it? Uh, There's two of them. They shall, they shall no, no fear. Maybe? No, no, no fear. There you go. I'm sorry. No, no fear. Yeah, that's <laughs> I have a podcast talking about horror heresy. It's all good. Um, <laughs> but it made me remind me of that where it's like you put the you put one side of a fight. Right, one of you came for a war, and the other one came for a ritual. And those asymmetrical <sighs> objectives make things interesting yes. in any context. Whether it's ultramarines killing word bearers who like Excellent. to be killed, or it's these guys who are just like. I mean, they're, mm. they're putting up a fight. You can't not fight them. <laughs> they're right there. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah. I, I love that kind of tension of, like, the more we kill them, the more they get what they want. Which is like, yeah. Oh. And, and it take and they're not understanding. Namajir and his people have no understanding of this. They, mm-hmm. they think they're winning. Yeah, yeah, they're having a bad time. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're having a great time at first. <laughs> and so while this battle is going on, Grammaticus finally connects with Alpharius, quote, and we think it's him. We think this actually is Alpharius because he discovers this kind of hidden desert base where there are like dozens and dozens of Alpha Legion uh, and finally gets to, um, you know, warn Alpharius of what's going on with the Black Cube. Yes. And fortunately, uh, that also gets, you know, the Alpha Legion then says to Naba, Jerry, you guys need to get out of here, get out of here. And he's like, what? I don't understand. Just okay, whatever, I told you, whatever you want to do. So most of the Imperial forces do extract from the planet in time, but many do not. And there's really interesting uh, description of how literally just regiments of tanks are overcome by this. It's kind of, you know, the opposite of the mist that came out. It's like this black cloud. It just keeps expanding and everything that's touched by it just dies. Um, The Alpha Legion, though, deployed to the planet did retreat intact due to John's warning. And so, you know, he's got some credibility now with Alpharius because otherwise he was just a dude warning, (laughs) saying, hey, exactly. you you need to meet with my buddies. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, and it certainly functioned as a a proof of goodwill, right? Don't die. Come here and talk with us. (laughs) Yeah, and plus, isn't it at this point that – Grammaticus actually tells Alpharius why he needs to meet with them and says something about Horus and stuff. And Alpharius is like, you're nuts, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was one of the alpha Legion guys mentioned um, like, Oh, you address him as war master. And Grammaticus is like, Oh my God, he's already the war master. He's like freaking out. We're and too late. He, yeah. And all know all Grammaticus knows is like civil war is coming and that's yes. it. And it has something to do with Horus. But when he got declared war master, that's that's when they have that back and forth. I thought that was funny. <laughs> well, and and I don't think that the Alpha Legion's reaction to his comments are out of place or not consistent because oh, no. every 
loyalist legion that you would have told that horror look what you know one of your favorite scenes when uh oh yeah garo got punched, punched in the face Garrow, for trying to be right? helpful <laughs> that that'll tell you <laughs> but yes. you so everybody extracts everybody's gone the planet dies essentially mm -hmm. and we're off to a planet called 42 hydra tertius hydra hydra hello hydra uh and this is a place where the cabal is supposed to meet with Alpharius. Yes. And the fleet has escaped on Earth, hovers over this planet, and we know what the, the purpose of this particular planet's choice was. What was interesting is that the planet initially appears to be uninhabitable. There's no place where there's compatible atmosphere or anything else. And all of a sudden... And this tells you how powerful this cabal is. And I think it was 30 or it was 300, I can't remember, kilometers in diameter area just appears on the planet's surface. Yes. Yeah, it was just hidden from view. Yep. And it appears to be compatible with human requirements. It's got an atmosphere. Everything else is cool. Um, and obviously it was created by the cabal mm -hmm. so that they could meet with people. And... Um, this is another point in the story that I just love. So uh, Alfarius has come to Namajira's flagship. Yes. And Namajira is lecturing Alfarius. Not good. And I love this part of the story because you know, Namajira is just explaining, oh, this is that, and this ship is this thing, and this is that thing. And oh, Alfarius he's mad too. He's like, you made me lose half my regiment. Or <laughs> He was mad because you warned him to leave, and then he was mad because he didn't warn him earlier. <laughs> Alfarius, you can just tell, is just tolerating this guy. Yes. That's it. And it was also funny because one of the Lucifer Blacks feels, you know, he gets this perception that Alfarius is kind of threatening Namajira. So he reaches for his weapon and Alfarius just looks over at the guy and he goes, you know, I hear that the Lucifer Blacks are brave, but I never heard that they were insane. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like, no, you, you don't have no idea what you're dealing with here. <laughs> uh, and again, Namajira just continues to make you just hate him because yes. he's so pompous and so conceited and he's every lord you know, commander <laughs> yeah and and it's all about him it's all about his uh his standing with the council of terra you know and i want to i have to recover my reputation because we lost the planet and my reputation is hurt because of all this and as you said it's your fault that mm -hmm. my reputation is hurt and you just go and, and you could just tell again that alfarius yeah. is Yep. Fine. This guy's what? got an expiration date on his head. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. Oh, man. So anyway, just, just a great scene. Um, and then we end up that uh, the Alpha Legion has uh, Sonica and Bronzy and some, uh, I think, uh, let's see, what is it? During, so... Sonica and Grammaticus are actually held kind of as prisoners on the Alpha Legion flagship. Yes. And also, uh, Grammaticus finds out that his uh, buddy Roxana is, has been captured by the Alpha Legion and kind of tortured by them to find some stuff out. And Pedosonica says, hey, you know what? I'm going to get you down to the planet because I know you need to get to the planet so that you can be the intermediary. You need to make sure this happens. So he ends up taking Grammaticus. They find Roxana. And when they find her, she's like almost brain dead. Like a little child almost. Yes, she got interrogated psychically by the Alpha yeah, Legion to hunt right? down Grammaticus. So she's not doing good. She had a bad day. No. <laughs> and so, boom, they, they have three of them head down to the planet. And they're also, you know, uh, Namajira's landing some of the Geno 5 to Chiliad and some others. Uh, on the planet to kind of, you know, it's aliens. Uh, so this huge ship then appears. Yes. And, the, uh, and that was another great part, Doug, was... Oh, yeah, because it came in screaming, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Namajir is screaming at his fleet commander, like, stop it! And he's mm -hmm. going, it sort of passes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. By the time they could arm the guns, the thing was already, like, from behind them to in front of them. <laughs> oh, snap. <Yeah. laughs> it's crazy. 
so that thing is where they're going to meet is this ship. But, um, you know, Grammaticus is there. And to your point, he finds this little pool of water thing and he communicates with them and says, we're ready to go. And all of a sudden, all of the cabal appears mm -hmm. you know, all there yes. around them kind of. And that was pretty cool. And they're going, John, where's Alfarius? And all of a sudden, this is so great. Like you say, plans within plans, you know, with these guys. Mm -hmm. Alfarius and Omegon, who's, you know, the other Alfarius, we're going to find out in a second, is like 50 arms Astartes just boom, all boom. of a sudden here surrounding this cabal. And you're going, oh, my God, that was so awesome. And you realize the whole time that Sonica and Roxana were playing Grammaticus. Yes. Like, they never intended to turn against the Alpha Legion. Roxana was fine. There was nothing wrong with her. And I thought that was so amazing that they were able to, like, overcome his abilities, that he mm -hmm. didn't realize he was being played like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I... I... <sighs> it, it ended up being a very fun kind of thing because you get to see what plots within plots look like, like in a real sense. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a good reveal. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a very cool little sequence of events because, again, the way it was written, you were absolutely sure that Sonica was turning on the Alpha Legion to help John, and Roxana was really screwed up. And yes. uh, yeah, you and, had no idea what was coming. And what's interesting is the Cabal is like we don't like the way that you you know. You had to have this meeting on your terms. We didn't like that. Why are you here all armed to the gills? And it's like, you you wanted the Alpha Legion because they're the Alpha Legion. What did you expect? Like, how else do they show up to parties? This is it, man. Like, what are you right. talking about? This is who you wanted. <laughs> and if you're so wise and you've been around for like 10,000 years, whatever it is, why is it that you don't understand these guys and know what they're going to do? Uh, I just, that, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So now we have our big uh, ballroom conversation, which is, I think, honestly, the entire book was just a delivery system to get us to this chat. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, do you do you want to continue or? No, go ahead. You okay. talk about it. I, the only thing I want to say is that the big reveal here mm -hmm. to me is that Alpharius and Omegon are both the Primarch. Yes. Of the Alpha Legion, and we are told here now for the first time ever in the Heresy that they are the only twin Primarchs. Yeah, so in those just Jason chambers and the uh, the Upper made his Primarchs, this one had twinsies, and it yeah. explains why Alpharius tends to be shorter than his other Primarchs, but he's more in line with his Space Marines. Yes. And this is how they fade into each other, basically. Like they, they can all be each other because their Primarch isn't. Uh, I think they. I think John Grammatica said he's like three centimeters taller or something like that. Like it's yeah, pretty negligible, <laughs> but right. um, yeah, that's how they do that. It's a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, Omegon up until then has always been in the background of conversations, and he mm -hmm. is kind of there, like, oh, he's uh, he's a recruit who's going up the ranks, and we just always keep one newbie in the area, <laughs> kind of a deal, <laughs> which is like, oh, that's cool. Um, but the you know they basically straight out say. We know your biggest secret in the Alpha Legion. We know that you're twins. Stop trying to mess with us. And let's just have a chat. So the guns yeah. go down. The talking begins. And essentially the Cabal lays out, we think a civil war is coming. And, you know, our, our visions have seen it. If the Emperor is allowed to live, then the universe will be torn in two. And we'll just be in a, a state of stagnancy and corruption for the foreseeable future. If he dies, then, then hopefully, I'm assuming their logic is, uh, because he's, I don't know. I don't know if it's because he's a perpetual, he'll come back or what the idea was, but there's some way of shutting things down by killing yes. the emperor before the heresy begins. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is essentially the plot that they threw out to the alpha legion. If you really love the emperor, you're going to save his empire by, going against him essentially yeah and horace this this is one of the things that just totally threw me to the other side on the on the cabal was their logic is that or what they saw was that if horace won 
he would be so angry and so regretful of what had happened that he would destroy chaos. Mm. He would literally destroy it. And you're going, what? wait, whoa. Do you have any idea what you're saying? And you, mm-hmm. first of all, their lack of understanding of chaos is, it, to me, is revealed there. Well, and... So, I mean, okay, so that's basically the end of the book. So we can start moving into, I mean, not, not the actual There's end. There's some other things going on, yeah. Yeah, but as this is the main thing, so we can stop here for a bit and just kind of wrestle through this. I I don't know. My, my Another part of my problem with this is that, like, I just don't believe the Alpha Legion would ever listen to this cabal. Like, I mean, it said they were shown a vision. At the end of it, Alpharius Omegon is like, all right, we got to do what we got to do. And they that's how the alpha legion joins chaos is they just decide well this will help things in the long run <laughs> and, well, you know, and, and when they show them the this vision yes I think there was an acuity that's what they called it yeah um they were they were staggered you know visibly the primarchs were staggered but i took a quote again out of the book and it was alfarius walking kind of away from the cabal after he saw this mm-hmm. and he said so, oh, he was talking to Slauda, that that Eldar. He said, "So what I do, Autark, from this moment on, I do for the Emperor." Yes. And you're like, well, yep. okay. What the heck does that mean? Yes. Right. So, and and this yeah. is this is how we get the Alpha Legion uh, inverse of the the Dark Angels being chaos. Is that these guys mm-hmm. are actually good guys because. Yeah, within their logic, they're trying to do the right thing, which doesn't make them good guys at all. But just like every other faction of chaos. <laughs> well, and let's think about it now. You know, this, and maybe I'm, you know, some other heresy, you know, fan will will correct me here. But this is the only uh, Space Marines Legion that actually sided with Horus that didn't turn to chaos. Yes, uh... they never. They never worship the chaos god. They never worship the pantheon. Yeah, they, they hated chaos, honestly, and they continued to state that they hated chaos. Alfarius did too, um, and and that's what's interesting when you think about what Alfarius said. And like, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do what we got to do. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it. I don't know how I feel about it. Like, <laughs> okay. Because on one hand, I just, I don't know. I, I just have a really hard time knowing all the the discussions that have happened before, like with Fulgrim meeting Eldrad Ulthuan. It just seemed really weird to have one meeting with a alien, a collection of alien races that you don't know their motivations and walk away mm-hmm. being like, I'm going to do this. And, mm-hmm. and I'm sure part of it is that just wasn't built up as like a logical thing. Maybe we just didn't see the Alpha Legion enough for that to be a reasonable decision in the book. Mm-hmm. Yes, but the whole book is about like not believing what anyone tells you, and they get to the end and they're told this is going to happen, and then they believe them, and it's like, I, what did you, were you guys here for the rest of this? This whole thesis? I mean, I, I sat through this book. Did you not sit through this book? <laughs> like to the characters, not the writer, but you know what I mean. I just had this weird kind of jarring like stuff's yeah. going to go bad. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and and you have to wonder too. I mean, we know subsequently we have some meta knowledge here. I mean, let's let's just face it, all of us, mm-hmm. listeners, and us, that the the Alpha Legion does at least initially side with you know Horus, mm-hmm. and you have to wonder though, were they ever really convinced by this little slideshow? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, and that's a great point too. Maybe they knew they couldn't trust it, but. You know, maybe by pledging allegiance to Horus, it guarantees that they could be in the right place at the right time to choose Horus or the Emperor later on in a and, bigger way. And maybe, you know, they said they're thinking because this is so Alpha Legion uh, and listening to it again. I never really thought about this before, but maybe Alfarius Omegon were like, well, let's side with Horus and, you know, see how things go. But in the end, we want to make sure the Emperor triumphs here. Oh, yeah. You know, but the best way to do that is to side with Horus, see what he's doing, and and kind of contribute, make him trust us. But 
maybe in the end then we do something else and, mm-hmm. and i love that about the alpha leech well yeah and cool. and to that point like i read the um the old black books like the big campaign horus heresy oh, books that yeah. came out and one of the things that is made very clear through those is that the Alpha Legion is a raging pain in the butt for Horus. Like, he hates managing them. He can't send them anywhere because they'll take, like, months to do something that should take a week because they want to infiltrate. Like, they are a legion of hemorrhoids to whichever side has them. Nobody, like, you know? <laughs> Everyone's like, this is so freaking annoying. Yeah. And so if true. anybody had to get it, I don't know, maybe they just... Maybe the Cabal just wanted to give it to Horus for the lulls. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe that. Yeah, it's it's. But I think, again, it's what makes this book interesting because you don't have this ending where you kind of know what's going to happen. I mean, even at the end of, you know, Horus rising when, you know, deep in the bowels of the vengeful spirit, Erebus is down there with the Athane. You kind of know what's going to happen. Yes. You, you know, in this book. Or, or any of the books we've talked about so far. You kind of know what the next piece is going to be. Here, you just don't really know. Yeah, and I think I, I think that is a big weak point of the book is that it doesn't feel satisfying and so it, that you're ready for the next adventure. Yeah, and I, and I think mm-hmm. if I had been told, like we're kind of you know helping listeners with this, that that's the way the book was going to end, it mm-hmm. would have been helpful. Um, that there wasn't this closure that, to your point, you expect. Yeah. Right? You yep. always expect closure in any story. Uh, but you don't get this here. And yeah. so it is a little less satisfying. But I still uh, think it's well worth the listener read. It's just a wonderful story. And I want to talk about, though, after... Yes, please. Yeah, we can move past the conversation. Yeah. So uh, the Alpha Legion leave the Cabal. The Cabal takes off. Um, Nambachir is getting really anxious about what's going on. He's like, okay, Alpharius is down there with a bunch of aliens, and this could be treasonous. Yes. And he orders all his weapons, all his fleet weapons trained on the Cabal vessel that's on the surface. Um, and he orders Bronzy, who's been captured by the Lucifer Blacks, to be tortured to death because he finds out from one of the Lucifers that Bronzy is a spy for the Alpha Legion now. And he's like, ha, I knew it. You know, and. Mm-hmm. So he orders his vessels to surround the Alpha Legion battle barge, his whole fleet. He even says that he intends on sending a letter of censure against the Legion to the Council of Terra. And I'm like, you, okay, loser, loser. I know, know. I'm going to go complain to the principal. Oh, yeah, no kidding. So I'm telling Dad. And, and of course, the Alpha Legion, they know what the hell is going on. Oh, yeah. The Alpha Legion is like, okay we got to respond to the Lord commander because he's just being a total jerk. And so the battle barge leaves orbit, you know, once all the guys are on there and all of a sudden they turn and they attack Nemajira's fleet. Yes. <laughs> it was just awesome. That it was, was the satisfying awesome. conclusion that we needed, I guess. Yes, yeah, it has nothing to do with it. Horus heresy. <laughs> yeah. So the Astartes, they just start wiping out all the fleet ships that are there. They just, blow into the middle of the fleet and the Astartes teleport on Nanamajira's flagship. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sonica gets there and he rescues Bronzy from the Lucifers. He just basically shoots them all in the head. And one of the, to your point, satisfying scenes is Alfarius finds Namajira fleeing from his ship, of course. Uh, and there's just this great scene where the Lucifers, you know, pull out their swords and their guns and all this stuff. And Alfarius just is like, really? Oh, he just goes <laughs> right through him. He just, yeah, nothing. And Nabajira, of course, begging for his life. Why would, Why am I not surprised? Yeah. And uh, just literally they wipe out the entire, you know, uh, fleet, the entire Imperial fleet. I mean, it's, it's gone. One battle barge. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. except for the people they, re- except for the people they recruited, which is Roxana you know, Sonic and Bronzy, the rest of the Imperials and the Geno 5 to Chiliad, they're all gone. They're just yeah. done. And that, I mean, and ending it that way with the fleet being destroyed, I actually liked because at that point, you know, the heresy hasn't happened yet. And now the Alpha Legion, who was tra- traitor, is like, oh yeah, we got here as fast as we could. The planet exploded. Namajira's fleet's gone. 
we're still loyal. Like they still have a way to keep going because they just don't talk. <laughs> yeah, and nobody knows this. Yeah, guy. exactly. <laughs> it's great. Uh, in the final scene, and I know you want to talk about this a little bit. <laughs> so Grammaticus leaves the cabal, and Slauda is like, "John, John, you're walking for the airlocks." Yeah, you did a good and, job. Where you sad about? Yeah, and so again, a quote from the book. John says, I successfully signed the death warrant for the human race. And then he hits the airlock button and goes outside and kills himself. <laughs> yeah, right? Which is um, the most metal way to be like, this all sucks. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> it is true. Oh my gosh. So, you know, you're, you just said it. I think we actually do get some uh, closure. We get some satisfaction. <laughs> After that very weird meeting and the reaction of the Primarch and stuff, mm -hmm. you, you kind of get what you expect in a heresy book to a certain point. Absolutely. Now, I my kind of knowledge of the Horus Heresy kind of butts up here towards the end because I started yeah. reading much earlier on. With Perpetuals, is this meant to mean that John Grammaticus is going to die and then be reborn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would fully expect that given the fact that he's... I think he's died at least once, but yes. I'm not sure. I can't recall. I, I know for sure he died once, but you can, yes. And now his hope, and based on the way Dan writes the book, his hope is that he will finally die. Yeah. Because of what he's just done. He right. thinks he's just done. But no, he, in fact, again, there's no spoilers here because we're going to talk about the heresy for of a course. long time. Uh, you know, John is part of the heresy story. And this is just where we're introduced to him. Yeah. And he will come back in other stories and play key roles and mm -hmm. just such a fascinating character because to me, Doug, he's human. Exactly. Yeah. He and, and I feel like he had to have the immortality to make him a character that we could follow. But it is good to have the human perspective compared to yeah. the demigods or whatever. It is. It really is. Uh, I just I just texted you like the minute I finished that book because I had completely forgotten about the ending or maybe I just didn't read it. Clearly the first time. I didn't realize he was just like checking out. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I got the text, he's like, Wow, that's pretty uh pretty morbid. <laughs> it's getting a little uh a little grim dark here, and then he just hits the eject button. <laughs> he's gone. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh so what were your th final thoughts on the book here as we wrapped it up? I think you need to go into this book, uh, if you're if you're gonna listen or read it, that it's different than the other books we've talked about or the other books you've read. Yes. It's very different in a lot of ways. And knowing that, I think you should still enjoy the story because it still is a heresy story and mm -hmm. written by a wonderful author. And the characters you're going to, because of the way it's written, you're going to have very strong feelings one way or the other about them. Uh, and again, just all the interactions that take place, the the way that Dan Abnett writes the different components in the Cabal and the Nerthian and the Alpha Legion, it's to me it's almost refreshing because it's so different yeah. uh, from a lot of other books. Uh, there is that speed bump that we both talked about <laughs> near the end. But again, you come out the other side with some satisfying action scenes and things like that. Yeah. So. I'd say for me, my takeaway is it, it is a good book. It It's like they wanted to share so many cool things mm. about the Alpha Legion, and there was just too much to share, if that makes sense. Like, sure. you know, at the end, it was kind of an exposition. Okay, they're the twins. Okay, the Civil War is coming. They chose to do it rather than joining Chaos. Like, all those are information bits that you want to know about the Alpha Legion, but mm. how they got there and were uncovered, I felt like... It yeah. was it was not everyone's cup of tea. It's just different kinds of literature. It's not a war story. It's an intrigue novel about spies. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of people who talk about heresy a lot more than we do and are very much more into it. But they talk about a list of books that you don't need to read. You can skip these books. Yeah. If you don't, I don't think this is a book to skip. And there are a lot of yeah. people that list Legion as that. I just don't think so because I think it's an enjoyable departure that – adds to the richness of the heresy absolutely i think anytime you get i think the Horus heresy books are great at this anytime you get a um you get to see how 
the space Marines in whatever context think and, and act mm. is very good. Like I loved the um, theoretical and practical of the ultramarines. Oh, right. The, um, what is it? The enumerations of the thousand suns or whatever. Yes. Yep. Seeing them talk to one another in veiled language. Everyone's alfarious. Everyone is alfarious and alfarious is everywhere. Like it's just this, it was a cool, um, but you can only experience that from the human side. And uh, yes. that's not what everyone's reading these things for. So I would I strongly suggest to our readers that they consider reading the Alfarius Primark book. Yeah. I think it would add to to your understanding your enjoyment of the Alpha Legion after maybe feeling a little bit of frustration from this book, mm -hmm. or, you know, that it's so different. I really enjoyed it. It was not what I was expecting. Uh, and I'm, I'm an Alpha Legion fan for sure. Uh, have been, uh, I just like how they're so unique in so many oh, ways yeah. in the yeah. Harris. Yes. And yeah. so now you can loudly and obnoxiously when you walk past anyone playing Alpha Legion, <laughs> declare that they're actually loyalists. <laughs> if you see other two people playing the game, stop their game and make that joke. That's great. Yes. We all love that. <laughs> Bonus points if they're playing against a Dark Angels player and you get to squeeze in that joke, too, about how they're actually traitors. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, okay, so next book. Let's wrap it up here towards the end. Uh, we already decided our next book, and it's going to be Scars by Chris Raitt. Um, I, before the show, Dan asked well, what kind of book do we want to read next, and I have really been enjoying these introductions to the various legions. Mm. And I said, do you know anything about the White Scars? Because I don't know oh, yeah. like, jack all about them. I, I mean, I know like obviously the visual references that they're making, um, but nothing culture-wise or anything like that. So yeah. I'm very excited. So. Yeah, Scars, Chris Excellent. Wright. Uh, one yeah. thing I do want to say is I was trying to find it on the Black Library website, and Scars is not listed unless it's mm -hmm. in a compendium or something that I'm not seeing, but it is available on Audible, so if you want to follow along, that's how I will be listening to it. Sure, and I'll bet you if you go to certain places, if you go to Amazon or somewhere else, yeah. I'm sure you can find a paperback copy somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have tons of used bookstores in the U.S., Half Price Books. Yeah. You just hop on their website. I'm sure you can get it cheap. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if you want to read the read the Dead Tree version, which is great. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Well, I don't have anything else. Do you, Dan? I do not, my friend. Okay. Well, we will listen to Scar and tune in next time to talk about some awesome White Scar action. Hopefully motorcycles and chainswords aplenty. <laughs> uh, back to the action. <laughs> Thank you so All much right. for hanging out with me today, dude. All right. No problem, man. It was It's always a pleasure to do so. All right, friends. You stay tuned and may the Emperor protect. Mm -hmm.